The idea of color correction and filtration is a, is a concept that we need to understand to work in film and video production. The reason being is that sometimes we're on locations, we may have to work with a certain type of light source, like fluorescence or like daylight coming through a window. And those types of sources, all the different sources in the world, can produce a very different color of light. We refer to color temperature or the Kelvin scale uh, and the Kelvin temperature of the light. What that means is the whiteness of the light, how much red, green, and blue is present to make it a very full spectrum light. So sometimes we have what may be a very, very orange light, and we need to alter that and bring that more toward the blue scale if, they, if we're working with daylight, for instance. Daylight is a very, very blue color light relative to television, or what we call tungsten lights. So if we're mixing the two, we either need to correct with gels the tungsten light and bring it toward the color of daylight, or correct the color of daylight, this very blue light, and bring it toward the warm orange color of tungsten lights. So we use different gels and filters to correct different types of sources on location, usually, uh, to, to make these, uh, all of these sources mix together in, into one very full spectrum of what we'd call white light. Uh, now, the understanding of Kelvin scale and, and uh, the manipulation of, of which gels to use is something that takes a little bit of understanding and also takes some time to, to learn to see which things work best for different types of film stocks and in different situations. But once you get the concept down, then there are very few situations that you'll find yourself in where you, where you don't know which way to turn. You have an idea of which type of source this is, what color it generally is, and how you need to work with gels and filters to alter that color to get your best effect on location. The human eye is sensitive to only a very narrow region of light called the visible light spectrum. Above and below this spectrum is light that cannot be seen by the naked eye. This visible wavelength spectrum, which is rated in nanometers or billionths of a meter, represents the scope of light that we work with in film and video production as well. When all colors of this visible spectrum are present, we call this white light. The eye perceives nearly all light as white light. Our eyes will automatically adjust for any deviations in color balance. But a video camera or film stock cannot compensate for the lack of any certain color of light. We must compensate through color correction. If we heat a piece of black metal hot enough, it will begin to glow, beginning first with a warm red-orange glow more electrical energy can be forced through a metal filament, and it gets brighter. As the energy is increased, the color of the light changes toward a cooler and whiter color. This visible heat is the basis for incandescent lighting, or the common light bulb. To measure the true color or whiteness of a light source, the Kelvin temperature scale was developed by 18th century physician Lord Kelvin. The color temperature of a source refers to the balance of color or the amount of red, green, and blue light that is radiated by a source. Simply put, the lower the color temperature, the warmer the color output of the source. The higher the color temperature, the cooler the color output. This color of light that is emitted by a light source can be called the spectral distribution of light. Incandescent sources, such as those used in our home, actually emit a very red-orange color of light, which registers at approximately 2800 degrees Kelvin. Although they are considered a white light source, because all colors are present, much more red and orange light is emitted than any other color. Standard tungsten lighting fixtures produce a similar but slightly cooler color of light at 3200 degrees Kelvin. The midday sun, which radiates a bluer and more even spectrum of light, is rated at approximately 5600 degrees Kelvin and is also considered a white light source. Depending upon the time of day, the weather and other factors, the color temperature of daylight can range from four or five thousand degrees to over 20,000 degrees Kelvin. A look at this professional fluorescent tube fixture demonstrates how a video camera or film stock will record two tungsten and two daylight color temperature bulbs. In this shot, with the camera set to record the color of daylight, the daylight colored bulbs appear white, while the tungsten bulbs appear a warm orange color. With the camera set to record the color of tungsten light, the two tungsten bulbs now appear white, and the two daylight colored bulbs appear quite blue. We can clearly see that the camera cannot see both color temperatures simultaneously as white light. It is for this reason that we sometimes must modify or correct the color of a light source to match either existing light conditions or other light sources.
There's a couple of important facts that you should understand about working with gels and filters. And the first, uh, especially about gels, is that when you put a gel on a light, uh, it does kind of the opposite of what you might think it'll do. For instance, if we put a blue correction gel on a tungsten light, it doesn't add blue light. It subtracts all the opposing or complementary colors to leave only that blue light to pass through. Uh, someone once told me of an analogy of, of adding a, a filter to your water faucet at home. You're not adding good water. You're subtracting all the bad unwanted particles out of that water to make it taste better. So gels and filters do the same thing. They subtract the opposing, the unwanted colors and leave only that color that, you, th that the gel is. For instance, a green gel, you're subtracting all the other colors and allowing only green to get through. Now the other thing you need to understand about gels and filters is that while you're subtracting all those other colors is that you're also losing some of your light value. So a lot of gel swatches uh, will have listed what you call a transmission factor. How much light gets through this gel? How much am I losing? So a particular gel might list a transmission of 25 percent. And what that means to you is that if you start out with a 1,000 watt light and put this gel on it, you're only going to end up with 250 watts of light, 25 percent of that, of that light value. So what you need to factor in when you're using certain gels is that, gee, if I wanted that 1,000 watts of output, I need to start with four times more light. I need to start with 4,000 watts of light. Then when I only get a 25 percent of it, I'll end up with that 1,000 watts that I need. So this whole idea of the complementary colors being absorbed, et cetera, uh, and the fact that you do lose light value as well is something you, it's important to understand about using gels. To understand how to utilize the many gels available to you, you must first understand how gels are designed to help you. A look at a page from the GAM Colors Swatch Book shows that several different points of information are provided for the user. Printed at the top are the company's gel number and a listing of the particular gel name. In this case, the color correction gel called half CTO, or one half color temperature orange. Below the gel name is the Kelvin temperature shift value. Using this gel to correct a light source will shift the Kelvin temperature down on the temperature scale by approximately 1700 degrees. That means that the source will appear 1700 degrees Kelvin warmer by using the gel. This is an approximate rating due to the fact that the degree of Kelvin shift will differ depending on the Kelvin temperature of the original source. Just above the graph is the transmission factor, a listing in percentage points that tells us the total transmission of light through the gel. This CTO gel transmits 73% of the visible light and absorbs 27% of the opposing colored light. Half CTB correction gel transmits only 44% of the total light value. This loss of light due to the use of any gel is an important factor to consider when selecting an instrument or calculating an exposure. Below all of these numbers is a graph which plots the spectral distribution of the gel. This means that the graph shows which wavelengths or colors of light are absorbed and which are transmitted through the gel. At the left of the graph is the transmission percentage and at the base of the graph is a nanometer scale. By comparing the graph with the color chart provided at the front of the swatch book and looking at the transmission factor and Kelvin shift, you can accurately predict the effects that each gel will have on a light source. The two most commonly used gels in our business are probably CTO and CTB. CTO stands for color temperature orange and CTB stands for color temperature blue. You might use color temperature orange in a situation where you're using tungsten lights in say an office to light your subject and outside is daylight which is a much bluer colored light. So you would use color temperature orange gel on the window to alter the color of, of the daylight, the apparent daylight that's coming through the window. It's going to subtract all that blue out of the daylight and leave the warm orange color that'll match the color of your lights that you're working with. So you're balancing for tungsten when you're using CTO in a window to alter the color of daylight to bring it toward your tungsten lights. CTB on the other hand, color temperature blue, you would use on the tungsten lights to alter the color of that tungsten light to match the color of daylight. So in theory a sheet of full CTB 
would color correct a, a tungsten light to the color temperature of midsummer day daylight outside around 5600 or 6000 degrees in theory. Sometimes that shifts to the time of year or where you are on earth or, or whatever. But the idea is that those are probably the two most commonly used gels to alter either our sources or the daylight of a window or something like that. And there's one other gel that should be mentioned with these and that's neutral density gel. Has no effect on the color of the light. It just reduces the amount of light that's being let through. So for instance, when you're working in that office situation and the windows behind the person and it's mid-sun summer in the middle behind them, it's very bright outside. So you might put CTO to alter the color of that daylight, but it's not going to knock down the window enough. The window is still going to be very, very bright relative to how much light you're working with in, inside the office. So you might add two stops or three stops of neutral density gel on top of that window with the orange gel to make the window less bright and the proper color so you can work with your standard tungsten lights in an office. When working against windows and lighting your subject with tungsten instruments, a combination of color correction and light reduction gels can be used on the windows to produce a very natural looking image. To light this interior shot of Devi, Bill Halshevnikov uses a 1000 watt Lowell DP light with a small Camaro light bank as his main light source. The large diffused surface of the light bank produces a very natural looking light quality on the subject. A light form frame with white reflective fabric is used as a soft bounce fill light source. Behind the subject, a 300 watt airy Fresnel light is directed at her hair and shoulders. A diagram of the setup shows the placement of the main light, bounce fill source and separation light relative to the subject and the window. Before we begin the process of color correction for the window, we should first look at the range of light reduction gels called neutral density gels. GAM Color Neutral Density, or ND gels, provide light reduction that ranges from a half stop reduction to four F stops of light reduction, with virtually no effect on the color of the light source. ND gels are rated as 0.3 neutral density equals one F stop of light reduction, 0.6 equals two stops reduction, and so on up to 1.2 ND gel, which is a four stop reduction. In this first image of Devi, the camera is balanced for tungsten lighting, and the camera iris is set for a proper exposure of the background. Although the subject is illuminated with tungsten instruments, the sunlight outside the window is far brighter than the interior lighting, and at this exposure of F11, the subject appears as a silhouette. The second image shows the results of opening the camera iris four stops to f2.8, which is the proper exposure for the tungsten lighting. While the subject is now properly exposed, the background window area is four stops overexposed and without any detail. To reduce the apparent brightness of the window in this shot, single 20 by 24 inch sheets of neutral density gel will be placed on the inside of the window behind Devi. Looking again at our image of Devi with the exposure set at f2.8, the window area is severely overexposed and without detail. With the addition of a single sheet of one-stop ND gel on the window, some detail is achieved in the background area, but the window remains overexposed. The window area at frame left will remain unaffected as a reference. A look at the effect of placing two stops of ND gel on the window reveals that some detail is now evident in the trees outside the window, but still the background appears overexposed. The effect of 0.9 ND or three stops of light reduction is substantial. There is plenty of detail now in the background elements, but the area near Devi's face is still slightly overexposed. One might decide to use this level of neutral density gel on the window for this shot. With the use of four stops of neutral density gel on the window, there is now good detail in all the background elements, and the focus of the image shifts back toward our subject. Relative to the clear window area at frame left, you can see how effective neutral density gel can be when working against bright windows. With the entire window area covered with four stop ND gel, the brightness of the background area has now been reduced to a level of exposure that matches the brightness of the small tungsten lighting setup surrounding Devi. But, although the problem of light reduction for the window has been solved, the true warm tones of the background have yet to be seen. CTO, or color temperature orange, 
is a color correction gel designed to shift the color temperature of the original light source toward the color and spectral distribution of tungsten light. In theory, a single layer of full CTO gel placed in a daylight source, such as a window at midday, will reduce the Kelvin temperature of the daylight by approximately 2600 degrees and convert the color of daylight to match the tungsten lighting. CTO gels are available in levels of correction of extra CTO, full CTO, three-quarter, one-half, one-quarter, and one-eighth CTO. In this first image of Debbie, there are four stops of ND gel placed in the window behind our subject. To begin the process of color correcting the daylight of the window toward the tungsten lighting, we will first add a single sheet of one quarter CTO to the neutral density gel. Once again, with the use of ND gel only, the window is now exposed properly, but the color of the daylight background remains quite blue. With the addition of one quarter CTO to the window, we can see a slight warming of the background colors. The frame left side of the window remains uncorrected as a reference. By switching to a sheet of one-half CTO, the window area looks quite warm relative to the bluer light at the frame left. With this sheet of one-half CTO, the exterior colors now appear accurate to the true colors of the background. The use of a sheet of three-quarter CTO shifts the color of the background possibly too far. The window area now appears very warm in color and slightly darker in tone. We must remember that all gels absorb the opposing colors of light and transmit only a percentage of the original light value. Three-quarter CTO transmits only 65% of the light, so while it provides color correction, it also acts as a light reduction gel. For a final image, Halshevnikov decides on only three stops of ND gel plus the half CTO for color correction. A look at our first image without the CTO correction gel reveals how the camera, when balanced for tungsten light, sees the cool blue color temperature of uncorrected daylight. The addition of the half CTO on the window provides the appropriate level of correction for this scene while working with a tungsten light. It's important to always check different levels of color correction gels for each setup. What may be right for one day or for one director can be entirely wrong for another. Another option for correcting the difference between the color of tungsten light and daylight is to use gels to correct the tungsten lighting to match the color of the daylight background. For this lighting setup, Holshevnikov selects a 650 watt Lowell Fresnel lensed light as the main light source. The bounce fill panel and the hair light remain in the same position from the previous setup. The camera is balanced for daylight. A diagram shows the positions of the lighting equipment relative to the subject and the window. Our first image of Devi shows the effect of uncorrected tungsten light on the subject when the camera is balanced for daylight. Tungsten lights emit a high level of amber colored light and here we see that the subject's skin tone appears overly warm in color. CTB or color temperature blue is a color correction gel designed to shift the color temperature of a tungsten light source toward the color and spectral distribution of daylight. In theory, a single layer of full CTB gel placed on a tungsten light source will increase the Kelvin temperature of the tungsten light by approximately 1450 degrees and convert the color of the tungsten light toward the color of daylight. CTB gels are available in levels of correction of extra blue CTB full CTB, three-quarter, one-half, one-quarter, and one-eighth CTB. Because of the varying transmission factors of the different CTB gels, wire scrims were used on the light to keep the exposure constant throughout this demonstration. Another look at our first image shows the overly warm tones that are produced by tungsten light when the camera is balanced for the daylight background. To reduce the relative brightness of the window, there are three stops of ND gel placed on the window behind our subject. To begin the process of color correcting the tungsten lighting toward the color of daylight, we will first add a single sheet of one quarter CTB to the 650 watt main light. By comparing the first image with uncorrected tungsten light, we can see that the addition of a sheet of one quarter CTB gel creates a slight shift in the color of the skin tones on our subject. The skin tones now appear slightly cooler, 
but they are still too warm to be considered a normal skin tone. The use of one half CTB gel on the light absorbs even more of the warm amber light from the tungsten instrument and provides only a slightly warm skin tone on our subject. One might decide to use this level of color correction if you or the director prefer a warmer skin tone for the shot. Attaching a sheet of three-quarters CTB gel to the tungsten light provides the appropriate level of color correction for this setup. The skin tones on Devi appear correct and natural, relative to the daylight white balance setting on the camera. The use of full CTB correction in this particular shot shifts the color correction of the tungsten lighting too far and the skin tones appear slightly blue and unnatural. As with the use of any correction gel, some testing or color temperature calculations must be made for each setup to achieve the proper level of correction. Returning to our first image of Devi, we could now see the overly warm skin tones produced by the uncorrected tungsten lighting. For this setup, the use of three-quarter color temperature blue correction gel provided the proper level of color correction for tungsten lighting in a daylight balanced shot. Removing the three-stop neutral density gel from the window reminds us of just how much brighter the sun is than a 650-watt tungsten instrument. Using tungsten lighting for window shots will almost certainly require the use of some light reduction gel on the window. The output of a small tungsten instrument combined with CTB gel and the resulting light loss that takes place when using correction gels cannot possibly match the intensity of the midday sun. For this shot of Devi, the use of three-quarter CTB gel on the tungsten light and three stops of ND gel on the window provided the appropriate levels of color correction and light reduction to create a natural looking image. Probably one of the most common color correction situations is when you're lighting a person inside a home or an office with your tungsten lights and there's a window behind them. Now you have two factor, factors to battle with this window. One is the brightness of the window because it's very bright outside during the middle of the day with the sun and also the color of the daylight coming through that window. So you can gel with CTO at the window and or gel your lights. Now if you're going to gel the window, if you're only seeing a very small portion of the window, you can probably knock it down with neutral density gel and CTO to get the right color. It's not a big deal. But if you have to see a very large window, uh, you have to see the whole thing, that gelling a window perfectly and seamlessly to the camera can be a very, very big task. Now if you're just gelling your lights with, with color temperature blue gel, that correction gel is going to absorb a lot of light. So you end up with a problem that you're losing all, all the light out of your instruments. So how many lights do I need to get into this situation to blast at this poor person to match the, the brightness of the window? It can end up to be six or eight hard light sources. It gets very hot in the room. You need a lot of power to run all these lights. And it doesn't look natural. It's not a great looking light quality on the person. There's alternatives. One of them are, is an HMI light source. HMI sources are daylight balanced. They're already color corrected to the color of the window. So that problem was already taken care of. And then on top of that, per the amount of power that they draw, they're very, very efficient sources. A 1200 watt HMI PAR might equate to three or 4,000 watts of tungsten light and it's already color corrected. So with one 1200 watt light that you can plug into almost any kind of circuit, you can generate enough light that's the proper color so that you can shoot daylight and match the brightness of the window. Now another way of going is fluorescence. Many of the fluorescent manufacturers have bulbs that you can just switch out and you switch to the daylight bulbs. And for instance, a, a four foot Kinoflow fixture with four lamps in it is a very efficient light source and it pulls almost no power. You can get that up close to the person. It's a very natural, very soft looking light quality and it's bright enough and color corrected toward daylight that you can probably match a lot of window situations with just that instrument as well. So rather than battle with the gels on the windows and battle with the gels on your lights, you can go with HMIs or go with fluorescence and make the job a lot easier and get better results. Whenever possible, using HMI daylight balanced lights can make shooting an interview against a window a quick and easy setup. To begin the lighting for this shot, a small Camaro light bank is attached to a speed ring for a 1200 watt airy par light. A stand is set up and the HMI light is placed on the stand and directed toward the talent area inside the small corporate office. The head feeder cable is then attached to the par light to provide power to the instrument. 
The newer generation of HMI PARs by Aeroflex provides the user with a more powerful and versatile lighting tool. The single-ended bulb design makes this instrument much more efficient, with a light output that equates to almost 5,000 watts of tungsten light. And the lightweight magnetic power ballast is dimmable with little or no shift in color temperature. The standard 1200 watt PAR is fitted with a wide beam lens and the Camaro light bank is then attached to the instrument via the barn door holders. The rear of this small quartz bank can be sealed up to avoid any spill light. The heat resistant materials of this light bank can withstand the heat from up to a 20,000 watt instrument. The light is then raised on the stand, is turned on, and the light bank is angled over the edge of the camera frame line. For a separation light, Halshevnikov will use a two-foot Kino Flow fluorescent light. Jamie pulls the four-lamp unit from the carrying case and begins to pull the locking electrical connectors from the two-foot-long tungsten balanced tubes. Kino Flow provides both tungsten and daylight balanced fluorescent tubes. The different tubes emit the same light intensity and they can be mixed within a fixture. The daylight tubes are marked with blue end caps. This light will be used as a separation or rim light and Halshevnikov will mix two tungsten lamps and two daylight lamps to create a slightly warmer color temperature for the instrument. The lamps are set, the light control louver is replaced and the instrument is turned over to attach the mounting plate. Four sturdy plastic pins connect the plate to the back of the instrument and an articulated 3 8 inch spud is used to attach the light to the grip stand. With the light firmly set on the grip stand, the barn doors are opened and the instrument is connected to the power ballast with a head feeder cable. Kinoflow ballasts are flicker-free at any camera speed or shutter angle. This image of the four fluorescent lamps shows the two warm tungsten lamps and the two daylight lamps. For this shot, the light control louver is removed to slightly increase the output of the instrument. With the two light setup complete, Olshevnikov prepares to record the images. A diagram shows the placement of the HMI PAR with the light bank and the fluorescent instrument relative to the subject in the window. The camera is balanced for daylight. The first image of our subject Meg shows the camera exposure for the ambient light in the office only. No lights are on and the camera iris is set to wide open. At this exposure, the window area is severely overexposed. By setting the camera iris for a proper daylight exterior exposure, we can see the interior of the office and our subject are little more than a silhouette. The camera is set at F8. By introducing the light from the main light source, the light level on the subject now matches the exposure of the window area. Using only a single 1200 watt HMI PAR provides enough daylight balanced light to easily match the brightness of the window. This HMI light pulls only slightly more than 10 amps of power so it can be plugged into most office outlets. The addition of the Camaro light bank increases the size of the main light source and provides a softer, more natural looking light quality on our subject. Due to the placement of the light bank, no fill light is required. Turning on the Kino Flow fluorescent fixture with the mixed lamps provides a slightly warm separation light on the left side of Meg's face and hair. The lighting is complete using only two lights and no correction or neutral density gels on the window. The use of HMI lights is an ideal time-saving method for lighting daylight balanced interior spaces. Another efficient method of lighting interior window shots is with fluorescent fixtures. The daylight balanced lamps can provide a very natural quality of light, but you may need to add some neutral density gel to the windows. Some shots require that you gel the entire window area behind the subject. If this is the case, you should first measure the window for the exact dimensions so that you can pre-cut the ND or correction gel. It's probably easiest to measure and cut the gel if you first roll the gel out in some flat area. The dimensions of the window are marked on the gel and the gel is then cut to size. There are two basic methods of attaching gel to windows. 
The simplest method is to use scotch adhesive transfer tape. This double-sided tape can be applied directly to the edges of the window. By first pressing your fingers against the paper coating on the tape roll, you can apply the tape to the window. Once the tape is on the window, you then can simply peel the paper coating off to reveal the glue. Although the glue is visible to the eye, once the gel is attached in the window, the glue virtually disappears to the camera. With all four edges of the window taped, the pre-cut gel is then just rolled onto the window and tacked to the adhesive glue. The gel can be peeled off and adjusted numerous times without affecting the glue. Once the gel is attached to the window, it is then easy to go back and smooth out any wrinkles in the gel. The gel that Jamie has applied to this window is two-stop neutral density gel. This method of attaching gel to windows is both fast and accurate. Another technique of applying gel to windows seamlessly might be called the wet method. Whenever you gel a window, it's a good idea to first clean the window thoroughly with glass cleaner. This method of attaching the gel to the window relies on the window being wet. With the window clean, a solution of water and a drop of liquid soap is then sprayed onto the window until the window is completely wet. The pre-cut gel is then applied to the window. Because the glass is wet, the gel sticks easily to the window. At this point, the gel should be worked into position and the wrinkles smoothed out. With the gel in place, the water and soap solution is used again to wet the entire piece of gel. Once the gel is soaked with the solution, a squeegee is used to clear the water from the front and back of the gel. As the water is removed from the gel, the gel is set into place onto the window. Once the water is entirely removed, the gel can still be adjusted at the edges to remove any minor wrinkles. Although this wet method may be a bit messy, the results are usually crystal clear. To light this office shot, a Kino Flow 4-foot light source is set on a grip stand and directed toward the subject and the window. The large 4-lamp instrument is fitted with three daylight balance tubes and one tungsten balance tube. This is a technique that Halshevnikov uses to produce slightly warmer color temperatures with the daylight fluorescence. The louver is removed to provide the maximum output from the fixture. To provide a soft fill light source, a Camara light form frame is assembled. Light form frames are made of an aluminum alloy tubing and have an internal bungee cord to keep the frame segments together during storage or travel. No tools are necessary for assembly and they can be used with diffusion, nets and reflective fabrics. For this setup, a white reflective and black fabric is added to the frame. The white reflective fabric is used to bounce light from the main light source back toward the subject to provide fill light. To provide separation and background lighting, a 1000 watt airy Fresnel lens light is set behind the subject and a single sheet of one half CTB gel is clipped to the barn doors of the light. The simple two light setup is complete. A diagram of the lighting fixtures and the bounce fill source reveals the placement of the instruments relative to the subject and window. There are two stops of ND gel on the window and the camera is balanced for daylight. The first image of Debbie shows the camera exposure for the ambient light in the office only. The camera iris is set to wide open and no lights are on. At this exposure, the window area is overexposed. By setting the camera iris for a proper daylight exterior exposure, the ambient light of the office is insufficient to provide any detail on our subject. Due to the two stops of ND gel on the window, the camera is set at F4. With the addition of the four-foot Kino Flow daylight fixture, the subject exposure now matches the window exposure. The large diffused fluorescent source produces a very natural light quality for an interior shot while there is still some shadow value remaining on the right side of Debbie's face. The use of the white reflective light form panel bounces light from the main light source to provide a soft fill light and reduce the density of the shadow on our subject's face. Turning on the uncorrected 1000 watt Fresnel reveals the very warm tones produced by tungsten lighting when the camera is balanced for daylight. 
Adding a single sheet of one half blue correction gel shifts the color of the tungsten light toward daylight and reduces the output of the light by approximately one f-stop. This image shows that a mixture of fluorescent and tungsten lighting with two stops of ND gel on the window can produce great results with very little effort. Some locations present what I would call more difficult sources to correct for. Uh, fluorescence, sodium vapor, mercury vapor. These are called discharge lamps and they work a little differently and, and the big difference is that they do not have a full spectrum of light that they're emitting. Uh, they may have bit, emit a very green yellow type of, of light or, or very orange colored light without the rest of the spectrum being present. So to shoot in that light all by itself you're not going to get a great look because all of the the colors of light are not present to make what we would call a white light. So we need to correct those and manufacturers make different correction gels for fluorescence and for different sources like that. Now one of the keys to getting through a situation like this is a color temperature meter. A color temperature meter is going to tell you the exact Kelvin temperature of that light and then in addition to letting you know what the Kelvin temperature is, it also tells you which color correction gels you need to add to that source to correct the color of that light to match either your tungsten or your daylight sources. Shooting under fluorescent lighting can produce unsatisfactory color and skin tones in film or video production. Understanding the limited spectrum of sources like fluorescence can help us to properly color correct at the light source and at the camera lens. Fluorescent lamps are available in two basic color ranges, cool whites, which have a color balance that is close to the color temperature of daylight, and warm whites, which more closely resemble the color temperature of tungsten. All industrial grade fluorescent sources have a very limited spectral distribution of light, and a Kelvin reading will only approximate the true color of the light. Cool white fluorescents are found in many corporate and industrial environments. The color of cool whites usually ranges from approximately 4,000 to 5,000 degrees Kelvin. The color of the fluorescence will range depending on the type of cool white bulbs and the age of the bulbs. Because these lamps are missing many of the warm colors of the spectrum, they emit a very green color of light. When working with cool white fluorescence, it is best to balance the camera for daylight or shoot with a daylight balanced film stock. When working with warm fluorescence, shoot with a camera or film balanced for tungsten light. To compensate for the limited color output of the cool whites, many professionals use a series of color correction gels called minus green. The range of minus green gels is designed to absorb much of the green light present in cool whites and correct the color of the fluorescence toward the color of daylight. Some larger scale location shoots require that you use the existing lighting as part of your illumination. In this case, you may need to color correct all of the existing practical sources. One of the easiest ways to gel a fluorescent source is to use gam color gel tubes. The gel sleeves are available in a full range of correction gels. This cool white fluorescent tube is being fitted with one half minus green correction gel. A 100 inch gel sleeve will cover two four foot fluorescent tubes and they can be cut to any length. Once the fluorescent tubes are gelled, they can simply be reinstalled into the fixture. This method of gelling fluorescent fixtures is quick and simple, and the gel tubes can be reused for another job. The following information is intended as a general reference for the color correction of cool white fluorescent sources. For any important color correction, running a test and the aid of a three color temperature meter will produce the most accurate results. When correcting cool white fluorescence toward daylight, try one quarter to one half minus green on the fluorescence. You may also need one eighth to one quarter CTB correction gel to match the approximate Kelvin temperature of daylight. When correcting cool white fluorescence toward tungsten lighting, try a combination of one quarter to one half minus green and one half to three quarter CTO. Or you can use Gam Colors Fluorofilter CW gel which is designed to shift cool whites to match the color of tungsten lighting. Another option for working with cool whites is to shift the color of your daylight balanced light sources such as HMIs or Kino flow fixtures to match the green color of the fluorescence. The range of the gels named plus green can be used to correct your fixtures toward the color of the cool whites. The overall green hue can then be removed by filtering at the lens 
or white balancing the video camera. A three-color temperature meter is designed to provide you with a working Kelvin temperature rating of a light source, and it will then suggest color correction gels to alter the Kelvin rating toward daylight or tungsten. An example of how a color temperature meter operates might be as follows. Under cool fluorescence, you might select daylight as your camera color balance, and then press the Kelvin temperature button. By depressing the light reading button on the side of the meter, the color temperature of the present light source will be displayed in the LCD window. Then by pressing the color compensating button, the meter will suggest a correction gel in the magenta green range. This reading of a plus four correlates approximately to one quarter minus green gel on this chart. By then pressing the light balancing button, the meter will suggest a correction gel in the amber-blue range. This reading of a minus 34 correlates approximately to one quarter CTB gel on the chart. A color temperature meter can be an extremely useful tool when working under difficult or limited spectrum sources. It takes a bit of practice to understand, and it can provide a great starting point for color correcting sources on location. There are a number of other methods of correcting for fluorescent lighting. This image of Lee was shot using only the overhead fluorescence in the office. The slight green cast to the image is typical of the color generated by cool whites. The video camera is balanced for daylight. One very simple method of correcting for cool white fluorescence is the use of a Tiffin color correction filter called the FLD filter. This filter is used in front of the lens when the camera or film stock is balanced for daylight. Using an FLD filter helps the color balance by absorbing much of the green light emitted by the fluorescence and by adding, in a sense, many of the warm tones missing from the fluorescence spectrum. For correcting warm fluorescence, Tiffin offers the FLB filter. When using these filters on a video camera, the best results are achieved by white balancing through the filter. Looking again at the uncorrected image of Lee, we can see the pale green hue in the skin tones and on the walls in the background of the shot. By adding the FLD filter to the camera, the skin tones in the image become much more natural and the walls in the background appear less green. Another look at the uncorrected image makes it easier to see just how green cool white fluorescence can look on camera. The simple addition of a Tiffin FLD filter creates the appearance of fuller spectrum lighting and provides much better results when shooting under cool whites. One of the little tricks that you can use when you're working in video production is what I would call fooling your white balance. And what that means is, let's say you're working in a fluorescent environment and you get a white balance uh, and then you check your skin tones and maybe they're a little to the cool side, they're a little more bluer than you'd like to see. Well, by holding a piece of gel in front of the lens while you white balance, you can shift that white balance or fool the camera into a different white balance than it would normally give you. So in this fluorescent environment, I might put quarter correction blue, quarter CTB in front of the lens and then hit the white balance switch. What that does is that tells the camera, gosh, it's, I'm supposed to be looking at white as a reference. This is so blue, I'm gonna, the camera says, I'm going to overcompensate for all this blue and really warm this up to cancel all that blue out. Then you pull the gel away after you're done and you end up with a very warm skin tone and that might be the skin tone you're looking for. So you can use different gels and different correction gels in front of your lens to fool the circuitry, to fool the camera and shift your white balance one way or the other when you're working on location. To fool the white balance of the video camera, simply use a sample from a large swatch book or hold a small piece of gel in front of the lens and then white balance as you would normally. A typical gel selection for fluorescent lighting might be one quarter CTB gel or a combination of one quarter CTB and one eighth plus green. A look at the standard white balance created under the cool white fluorescence shows the slight green hue that is so commonly associated with fluorescent lighting. By shifting the white balance with a piece of one quarter CTB or one eighth plus green gel, the camera has altered its color balance slightly to produce more natural skin tones and a better overall color. But even with a better color balance, the overhead fluorescent lighting is not intended to be used as the primary lighting for your subject. Sometimes the use of some low intensity supplemental lighting can make the people in a fluorescent based shot look much better on camera. 
For this setup, Halshevnikov has selected an airy 650 watt Fresnel and a small Camaro light bank as the main light source. A Kino Flow two foot fixture with two daylight lamps is used for separation light on the subject. The camera is balanced for daylight. To shift the color temperature of the warm tungsten fixture toward the color of cool white fluorescence, a small piece of one half CTB gel is placed in front of the airy light. Another option for correcting the source is to use the color correction diffusion fabrics that attach to the front of the Camara Plus light banks. These color correction fabrics are available in a full range of CTB and CTO colors. This first image of Lee reveals the effects of the overhead fluorescent lighting and the slight green hue achieved with a standard white balance. The addition of the two lighting instruments changes the appearance of our subject noticeably. Not only is the lighting on the subject's face more even and flattering, but by using the half CTB gel on the tungsten fixture and then white balancing for that color of light, we have shifted the overall color balance of the image to a range that is now closer to the color of the fluorescence. This shift of color balance makes the background areas appear less green as well. A look again at the image without the use of the two lighting instruments shows the deep eye shadows that is characteristic of overhead lighting. The addition of some soft supplemental lighting can help to make your subjects look their best on camera. Another approach to lighting this same shot is to use a KinoFlow two-foot four-lamp fixture as the main light source. The four daylight balanced lamps provide a soft key light for the subject while also allowing the video camera to work in a daylight color balance. The final image from this lighting setup shows once again that a basic understanding of color temperatures and color correction can help you to select the proper lighting tools to make your fluorescent based images look their best. Sometimes we work in locations where it's such an enormous place like a bottling plant or some kind of giant warehouse and you're dealing with a very limited spectrum light like sodium vapor and the best option is, because you can't turn all the lights off is just to narrow your focal length of your lens down, shoot with longer lenses, frame up your subject that'll limit your background area and then just overpower all of that off-colored light in there so for instance you'd light your foreground your subject area put a rim light on it and then light your background with tungsten lights or whatever you're working with and by overpowering all of that off-colored light you can basically get a good look but you can't do these massive wide-angle shots that way so you're limiting your subject areas using longer focal length lenses narrower fields of view and selecting certain areas and certain backgrounds and just overpowering all the, the off-color light and lighting just your subject and your background in those areas. This industrial location is illuminated with a very warm light of sodium vapors. In this case, correcting the numerous instruments in the ceiling would not be possible. A quick way of working in an environment like this is color correct your own light sources toward the color of the ambient light. In this case, adding some level of CTO and then filter or white balance at the camera for proper tones. By just shooting with slightly longer focal length lenses, you can narrow your lens angle of view and light the smaller area with your uncorrected instruments. In this way, you are essentially overpowering the ambient lighting with your own sources. In general, you should light with tungsten instruments for warm colored sources such as sodium vapor and light with daylight colored lights for cooler sources such as mercury vapors. One of the most important aspects of color correction and filtration is, is understanding when not to color correct something. I think some of the most stunning imagery can be created when you let sources go and you start to mix complementary colors. The warmth of a tungsten source and the, and the cool uh, color that comes from daylight can be a beautiful mix of light and it happens in all the arts. In paintings they use complementary colors constantly and in photography and in film and video it should be used as well. So I think a problem can occur if you get so tied up into color correction that everything needs to be color corrected so it all perfectly matches and after a while you can actually end up with some pretty boring imagery. So I think the idea here is to understand it understand when it's really important that you do need to color correct certain sources to make a shot work and then also when to know to, when to let it go and have some fun with it and mix some color temperatures and be bold and have some fun with it. 
Probably the most commonly used mixed source lighting is achieved by lighting the scene with daylight balanced instruments and allowing the incandescent practical lights to mix in. With the camera balanced for daylight, the practical lights appear warm in color and provide a visual contrast in these images. In this shot, we can see how the presence of the colors from the practical lamps provides a sense of warmth to the room. Without the warm light of the practical lamps, the room seems possibly less inviting. Turning off the two HMI PAR lights reveals the true ambient light of the room. So with the use of daylight balanced instruments and the warm practical lights of a location, we can use mixed lighting to affect the feel of the imagery. The opposite approach can also have a pleasing effect. This exterior image was captured at dusk by balancing the camera for tungsten light. With this approach, the tungsten lighting in the foreground appears as white light, while the incandescent lighting in the background areas still has a slightly warm color rendering. But with a tungsten camera balance, the color of the sky appears as a deep, saturated blue. Using a daylight camera setting for this shot makes the foreground and background lighting appear warmer, but the color of the sky is not nearly as dramatic. Neither shot is right or wrong. It is purely a matter of taste. So we can see that not only is the color correction of light sources important, but that the selection of a film stock or camera balance can also greatly affect the image. Once you've achieved the look that you want through your lighting and through color correction or gels, one of the last areas of manipulation that a lot of people don't even think about is filtration, and which means glass filters at the lens. And what you can do with filtration is actually change the mood or the feel of the piece, and that becomes even more significant with videotape, because video is an electronic process, and it can be so, so unforgiving and so you are there that it's hard to give a feel or a mood to a piece, especially on videotape. So there are diffusion filters and filters to add a little warmth to the image or cool down the image. There's lots of different filters that you can be, actually change the feel of the piece you're working on. Now there are also a wide range of filters that not only change the color, but they're called graduated filters. So it may be a, a, a cool blue at the top and it graduates to clear, or a neutral density, two stops of neutral density and it graduates to clear. And when you start to get into graduated filters, everything kind of it's your last real area of manipulation because you can knock down an area of brightness or add a sunset to a sky that is just gray clouds or bring a little more blue into the color of the water. There's so many different ways you can manipulate an image with filters and graduated filters. Now, once you've decided to get into filters, if you're going to get used, say, a diffusion filter or a warming filter, that could indeed be a round filter, and you could screw that onto the front of your lens. Now, if you need to add other filters and you start stacking them, that can start to get a little cumbersome, and you can even vignette your image. You can see the dark edges of those filters when you pull out wide with your lens. What you want to get into when you start getting serious about filters is called a matte box. And a matte box is basically a glorified lens shade, and it's there to hold your filters up to three different filters. And it also is there to help control some of the spill light on the set or wherever you're working and keeping that light off the front of your lens. If a lot of light strikes the front of your lens, it ends up raising your black levels, and so your contrast shifts a little and you don't get the rich, saturated blacks you might be looking for. But more importantly than that, once you get into graduated filters, and I let's say there's a, a horizon line that's that's a third of the way up from the bottom. Well, if I have a round filter that's a graduated filter, all I can do is spin it around and that graduated edge stays right in the middle. So when you get into square and rectangular filters, you can manipulate and shift exactly where you want that graduated edge to bring a sunset color or to, to knock an area down in brightness. All these different ways you can manipulate the image just through filtration. So I think once you get the lighting side of things down, filtration is another very important area that, that can really significantly change your imagery. The Tiffin Filter Flex Matte Box is a fully adjustable, lightweight matte box system for film or video production. It can accommodate up to three filter stages, and each filter can independently rotate 360 degrees. The Filter Flex can work with either internal or external focusing lenses. There are an enormous variety of camera filters available. As we have seen, the color correction of an image can occur through lighting and also at the lens. There are two standard correction filters available for correcting film stocks toward the tungsten or daylight color balance. 
If you need to capture a tungsten balance shot with a daylight film stock, you can use a number 80A filter to correct the warm color of the tungsten lighting for the daylight balanced film. If you need to capture a daylight image with a tungsten balanced film stock, a number 85B filter will correct the cool color of the daylight for the tungsten balanced stock. As with the use of gels, both filters create some level of light loss that must be factored into your exposure, and there are numerous grades of each filter available to produce different levels of correction. The Tiffin 812 filter is a very light grade of warming filter. This filter was designed to improve skin tones and to add just a bit of warmth to the overall scene. Halshevnikov uses this filter often for interviews and for other types of interior and exterior scenes as well. Some of the most popular filters used are diffusion filters. There are a wide variety of diffusion filters available, but there are a few that Bill Halshevnikov uses most often for all types of production footage. For people shots, the Tiffin Pro Mist, Black Pro Mist, and the Soft FX filters are a popular choice. Using the Pro Mist filter diffuses or reduces the sharpness of the image slightly while also reducing the contrast in the image. This filter is available in varying levels of diffusion, and Halshevnikov also likes the look of this filter for food shots. The Black Pro Mist provides a similar diffusion effect as the Pro Mist, but the reduction in contrast is less obvious. A one-half Black Pro Mist is a popular filter that can be used to take the electronic sharpness out of any video production images. This filter is especially popular for interviews, and other people's shots. The Soft FX filter is another type of diffusion filter that diffuses the image, but this filter has the ability to diminish fine details such as blemishes or wrinkles without losing sharpness in the image. This filter is also popular for interviews and other types of people shots. Another type of filter that is popular in both film and video production is the graduated filter. Graduated filters, or grads, are available in a wide variety of colors and densities. One very useful grad filter is the Neutral Density, or ND grad. In this shot of a hotel exterior, the top of the building and the sky are very bright relative to the exposure of the rest of the image. Through the use of a two-stop ND grad placed at the top of the image, only the sky and the building top are reduced in exposure by two f-stops, which evens out the exposure for the entire image. This golf course clubhouse shot is another example of the use of ND grads. With the interior of the clubhouse lit by two 1200 watt HMI PARs and the camera iris set for a proper exposure of the interior, the window in the shot was approximately four stops overexposed. With the use of two two-stop ND grads, for a total of four stops of light reduction, the graduated filters were positioned in the matte box to affect only the window area. With the use of two simple ND grad filters and a carefully composed image, this difficult shot was made possible without the use of neutral density gels on the large window. Color graduated filters provide yet another way to shape your imagery. Probably the most common use of a color grad is the creation of a beautiful sunset from a colorless sky. Tiffin offers a variety of pink, blue, lavender, orange, and other color grads to help you get the most from your exterior locations. This afternoon fishing shot was enhanced by the use of a color graduated filter called a number two twilight grad. Once again, we can see how the simple addition of a filter can change the look and feel of an image. As with the use of lighting instruments and gels and diffusion, the matte box and filters can be looked at as just one more tool for the process of image making.